Hey Steve, are you going to review the Orville? Steve, what do you think of the Orville this year? Why haven't you made a video about Season 3 of the Orville, Steve? Did you watch the Orville, Steve? Are you going to do an Orville video? Steve? Fuck! Yes! I'm doing it! Alright? Jesus! I did watch Season 3 of the Orville, and broadly speaking, overall, I liked it. I liked it quite a bit, actually. It's good. How good? Let's see. This was the Orville's third season, but its first season that was released directly to Hulu. Many of us assumed that the move from the Fox network to direct to streaming would be accompanied by a budget cut and a reduction in the show's scale, but that turned out to not be the case at all. I don't know how big the per-episode budget of Season 3 was compared to the first two seasons, but if anything, the Hulu version of the show looks even more expensive than it ever did on Fox, and it never looked bad to begin with. The Orville is the ultimate Star Trek fan series. It's TNG with the serial numbers filed off. The literary term for this is pastiche, and I think that is the best term for what the Orville is. In its first season, when it leaned much farther toward comedy, it was sometimes described as a parody or spoof or takeoff of Star Trek. It has grown beyond that stage, gained confidence and a voice that is more or less its own. But the similarities to Star Trek, Next Gen in particular, remain. The titular ship evokes the Enterprise D with the smooth and flowing lines of its exterior and its welcoming, brightly lit interior. The uniforms are very TNG, simple and colorful, with the various colors indicating the different divisions in which the crew members serve. And speaking of the crew, not everyone has a TNG equivalent, but there are a few. Captain Mercer and Commander Grayson have a romantic history. They were married, then divorced, and eventually become close platonic friends, which is similar to that of Riker and Troy. Lieutenant Commander Lamar begins as a helm officer before being promoted to chief engineer, a la Geordi LaForge. Chief medical officer Dr. Finn is a single mom, like Dr. Crusher. Isaac, do I? He's the automaton who doesn't experience emotions, yet somehow becomes the most poignantly human member of the crew. I think we know which TNG character was his inspiration. <laughs> Actually, for season one of TNG, that kind of works. That's better, yes. Obviously. And then there's the Orville's second officer, Lieutenant Commander Bordas, who pretty much is Worf. Except Bordas is into dudes, while Worf... Yeah, Bordas is basically Worf. By the way, none of this means that the Orville is bad. Yeah, it's flagrantly cribbed off of one incredibly popular series, but, and maybe this is the Star Trek fan in me talking, I don't know, there's something kind of endearing about the idea that Seth MacFarlane missed TNG so much he decided to just create his own great value version of it and cast himself in the lead. Because if you're going to leverage your success to make a wish fulfillment series, you might as well go all the way, right? And, like I said, after a very hit-and-miss first season, the show grows up a lot. The second season is much better than the first, more consistent in quality and tone, and more ambitious in terms of its storytelling and its ventures into social commentary. That consistency and that ambition are both defining qualities of Season 3. In fact, I think they're the reason the Orville's third season is easily its best. In Season 3, the Orville feels like it's finally figured out what show it wants to be. The awkwardly shoehorned jokes that beset the first season and at times the second are gone. The social commentary is still there, is prominently featured, and actually ties in with the overarching story of the season in a meaningful way. And the science fiction premises of several episodes are explored thoughtfully and creatively, going places that none but a handful of the very best TNG episodes ever dared to go. I'm not going to do an episode-by-episode -episode breakdown of the entire season, but I do want to single out a few of the real standout shows from Season 3. 
and also talk about that larger story arc and some other recurring plots that tie the season together, because I think it all comes together quite nicely. Spoilers from this point forward, in case I need to mention it. So, there were several outstanding episodes in the Orville's third season. There were no bad ones, if you ask me, which, by clicking on this video, you implicitly did. And that was your decision, not mine. But for me, there were three that deserve special mention. The first is episode five, titled A Tale of Two Topas. It's a follow-up to About a Girl, one of the most controversial episodes from season one, where the infant child of Bordas and his husband Clyden is forced to undergo sex reassignment surgery in accordance with the no-girls-allowed culture of their homeworld. That episode attempts to use the conflict over the gender of the child to make an argument for the rights of trans people, but to lots of actual trans people, the metaphor was so flawed with its suggestions of biological essentialism that it poisoned whatever positive message the creators hoped to deliver. With A Tale of Two Topas, the Orville tries again to say trans rights, and does a much better job of it this time around. It's been two years, and thanks to a convenient soap opera growth spurt, Topa is now a young adolescent. Raised as a boy up until now, Topa confides to Commander Kelly Grayson that he feels sad and uncertain about himself, as though he's somehow incomplete. Kelly realizes that Topa is experiencing gender dysphoria, and after trying to discuss the problem with Bordas and Clyden and getting nowhere, mostly due to Clyden's bitter recalcitrance, Kelly points Topa toward a secret file stored in the ship's computer that reveals the truth about Topa and the sex reassignment surgery, which has been kept a secret from Topa until now. Finally knowing the full story, Topa declares, I am female. And from then on, the episode comes down unapologetically on the side of Topa being allowed to transition and have her identity as a girl acknowledged and respected. The Mocklins, an important ally to the Planetary Union, don't like this one bit, and for a time, fear of upsetting the Mocklins is a roadblock to Topa's medical transition, but eventually they find a technicality to exploit. Isaac, who is technically not a member of the Union, performs the surgery necessary to complete Topa's medical transition. Additionally, Bordas breaks up with Clyden over Clyden's refusal to accept Topa as their daughter. And the episode ends with Captain Mercer allowing Topa, who aspires to become an officer in the Planetary Union fleet someday, to sit in the captain's seat and give the order to get underway. A beautiful moment of acceptance and celebration, although the nitpicky writer in me still wishes they'd found a more elegant final line for this episode than engage quantum drive. The use of Topa's story as an analogy for the trans experience works a lot better here than it does in About a Girl, mostly because Topa is now old enough to be able to have and articulate her own experience. Before, she was a baby who was having decisions made about her by adults. Now, she's an individual with thoughts and feelings and a sense of personal identity. And that sense of identity tells her that she's not a boy even though she's been told that she's one for her entire life. I'm cis myself, so I don't know personally, but based on what I've learned from listening to trans friends and other trans folks talk about their experiences, this sounds a lot more relevant to what trans people actually go through than what we see in About a Girl. It's not perfect. There's still the element of biological essentialism and the suggestion that transition must necessarily include a medical component, which is problematic and excludes the experiences of many trans people, but it's a lot better. It'll do as a delivery device for the message, which is that trans people deserve acceptance, respect, and equal rights. It's not just the message and the fact that they didn't completely botch delivering it that makes A Tale of Two Topas a good episode, though. There are some extremely cathartic character beats, like 
the revelation that Bordis is the one who gives Topa the password needed to access the secret file Kelly shows her. The scene where an enraged Clyden attacks Kelly and Kelly easily outwrestles him and promises to break his arm next time. Transphobes getting their asses kicked is always a mark in the plus column for me. And the moment following his very loud, very ugly breakup with Clyden, when Bordis turns to the distraught Topa and tells her matter-of-factly, Listen to me. You are perfect. And given the state of the world today, there's something incredibly moving about watching the entire crew pull together and fight to do what's best for this trans child. Nice work. The next episode I want to talk about is the one that follows A Tale of Two Topas, episode six, Twice in a Lifetime. This one finds a clever and thought-provoking fresh angle on time travel shenanigans. When Lieutenant Gordon Malloy, helm officer and best pal of Captain Mercer, is accidentally thrown back in time to the 21st century, his friends on the Orville follow him back to mount a rescue and preserve the timeline they know. But their jump to the past is slightly inaccurate. When Mercer and Grayson find Malloy, it's the year 2025, and he's been living in the 21st century for 10 years. He's gotten married and started a family. When Mercer and Grayson tell Malloy that they've come to take him home, his response is unequivocal. I am home. It's a really interesting dilemma. What do you do when you go back in time to rescue someone who was accidentally sent to the past, and when you get there, they don't want to leave? When you say, what about the timeline, and their answer is, fuck the timeline, what's the counter-argument? In the episode, the counter-argument is to just do the time jump again, go back to an earlier point before Malloy had a family when he still wanted to be rescued, and pick him up from there. Except, doing that erases his life with his family. His marriage never happens, his children never exist. Only Mercer and Grayson even remember Malloy's 21st century family. This problem and the solution Mercer and Grayson ultimately go with raises all sorts of interesting questions, which the episode actually engages with. Is it right for Malloy to marry someone from the 21st century and start a family knowing it could cause changes in the timeline that might potentially result in the future he comes from never happening? Is it creepy? that the woman Malloy marries is the same woman on whom he develops a fixation in an episode from an earlier season. Actually, that's definitely creepy. But is it so creepy that we just shouldn't be okay with it under any circumstances? Part of what makes the episode so effective is that it presents Malloy's side and Mercer and Grayson's side so that both seem reasonable. When Malloy says that he tried to hunker down and stay out of history's way for the first few years, but eventually he realized no one from his own time was coming to his rescue and decided to go out and make a life for himself, it's difficult not to sympathize with him. How could you expect anyone to do anything else in his situation? But when Mercer points out that Malloy's actions threaten the existence of the future they all come from, that makes sense, too. How much is one person's happiness worth? On a more technical level, I enjoyed how the story finds a new way to explain why the present doesn't instantly change once Malloy travels to the past. According to Isaac, because the possibility still exists that the crew of the Orville will go back and rescue Malloy, thus preventing any changes he will cause, they exist in a superposition between the original timeline and the potentially altered timeline. One timeline or another isn't actually set until they act. It's an explanation that manages to be simultaneously elegant and extremely complicated, which is impressive in and of itself. The method by which the Orville returns to its own time is clever as well. The time machine used to make the initial trip to the past is damaged, but Chief Engineer Lamar is able to fly the ship back to the future by accelerating to near light speed and taking advantage of time dilation. It's reminiscent of the slingshot effect used a few times in Star Trek, but a little different. And like all the best technobabble, 
it references an actual scientific phenomenon, and it doesn't obscure what the characters are actually doing or trying to do, which means their actions are comprehensible to us, which means they can actually mean something to us. The last episode I want to look at specifically is the second to last of the season, Episode 9, Domino. In this episode, the Planetary Union develops a weapon of mass destruction capable of destroying entire fleets of Kalon ships. With a large enough energy source, the weapon carries the potential to wipe out the entire race. And because the Kalon pose such an urgent existential threat, they're roughly equivalent to the Borg in Star Trek TNG, there are those among the top Union brass who argue that they should use the weapon to do just that, to destroy the Kalon before the Kalon decide to destroy everyone else. So it's a nuclear weapons metaphor, but it also raises difficult and compelling questions beyond that. Questions like, should we be bound to respect our enemy's right to exist even if they are an urgent threat to our existence? The leadership of the Planetary Union decides to send the Orville to the Kalon homeworld to demonstrate the power of the weapon in the hope that it will convince the Kalon to agree to a truce. They reluctantly agree, feeling that they have no choice, since they have no defense against the weapon, and it can literally kill all of them in a matter of seconds. But the truce isn't good enough for some within the Planetary Union. An admiral, played by Ted Danson, a remnant of the Hey, Look Who It Is! stunt casting that was a hallmark of the show's previous seasons, steals the weapon and secretly gives it to the Krill, another enemy of the Union, with the understanding that they will use it to destroy the Kalon. And that is an interesting twist, because once the Union finds out what Admiral Sam Malone has done, it sends the Orville back to the Kalon to say, Hey, remember that ultimate weapon we just used to intimidate you into not killing us? Funny story. One of our admirals, well, he went and did a silly thing. He stole that weapon and gave it to the Krill, and now they're going to use it to kill all of you. The heroes have to team up with the villains to save those villains from some other villains who have a doomsday weapon that the heroes invented. It's not just a clever way to reshuffle the alliances of the show's various civilizations, it's a way of exploring the unintended consequences of peace through superior firepower, and of forcing our heroes to live up to their principles. Principles they already compromised by creating and using a doomsday weapon. It's good stuff. And it's all resolved on a very human note. Despite the geopolitical, or astropolitical, I guess, complexities of the plot, the fate of our heroes and their world comes down to a single act of sacrifice. A human, Charlie, the Orville's other helm officer, staying behind to prevent the Krill from using the weapon, even though she knows it will mean her death. The sacrifice is made even more pointed by the fact that Charlie has been the most ardently anti Kalon character on the show this year. She's been reluctant to embrace Isaac, a Kalon who is on the side of the good guys, because she lost a loved one in the Kalon attack that took place at the end of season two. Her choice to give her own life so that the Kalon can live is so unexpected by the characters, I mean, most of us probably saw it coming a mile away, that it convinces the cold and logical Kalon to cease hostilities and become willing allies with the Planetary Union. The peace that the Union sought to gain at gunpoint at the start of the episode becomes genuine by the end, thanks to Charlie. Charlie's fate is the payoff to a story that begins in the first episode of the season and develops over the course of these ten episodes. Well, nine, since Charlie doesn't make it to episode ten. That's something else that makes the Orville's third season its best. Not just good episodes, good multi-episode arcs. A few of them, in fact. Charlie's character arc throughout the season is intertwined with Isaac's. When we meet Charlie in the first episode of the season, one of the first things we learn about her is that she is not at all okay with Isaac being on the ship. And, as it turns out, she is not alone. 
In the aftermath of the Kalon attack last season, lots of Orville crew members are concerned about still having Isaac aboard, even though he ultimately sided with them against his own kind. Realizing that his presence is becoming an issue, Isaac, who values efficiency above pretty much everything else, concludes, quite rationally, that the most useful thing he can do to improve operations on the ship is kill himself. So he does. Isaac's death and its aftermath are handled very well and make for excellent drama, even though the entire time we know intellectually that it's not going to stick. Isaac is a series regular. He's in the opening credits. He's not going anywhere. Also, he's the Robot Man in I Can't Believe It's Not Star Trek, and the Robot Man doesn't get to stay dead. Silly Robot Man, the peace of the grave shall never be yours. By the end of the first episode, Isaac is back, thanks to a crucial assist from a very reluctant Charlie, and he and Charlie spend most of the rest of the season figuring out how to work together. They never become friends or anything, but Charlie does soften somewhat toward Isaac, and he is seemingly re-embraced by the rest of his crewmates, including Dr. Claire Finn, whom Isaac had been dating prior to the whole temporarily joining forces with the Killer Robots incident last season. Claire and Isaac rekindle their relationship slowly, cautiously, throughout season three. It gets pretty serious. At one point, Isaac is briefly able to experience emotion, and he proclaims his love for Claire before his circuits overload and he has to go back to his old self. In fact, they eventually get engaged, and their wedding is the central event of the season finale. That's one of my favorite creative decisions of the entire season. I'm not a big fan of weddings, real or fictitious ones, but I very much appreciate the decision to get all the epic space battle stuff out of the way in episode 9, leaving the last episode open for a smaller, quieter, more character-driven story. The wedding doesn't just bring Isaac and Claire's arc to a satisfying conclusion, it also puts a nice little bow on the story of the Planetary Union and the Kalon. Knowing that Claire has invited her friends and family, and not wanting his side of the venue to be empty, Isaac invites his family, the Kalon. All of them. And they come. All of them, the entire Kalon fleet, arrives at the Orville's position, and a group of them are invited aboard to attend the wedding in person while the rest are able to watch remotely. The killer robots, who ended the last season by trying to wipe out all biological life, end this season as allies and welcome guests, mingling at the reception along with everyone else. It's profound and profoundly silly. The Orville at its best. But the Kalon going from extinction-level enemies to allies is only half of the realignment that takes place in Season 3. The other half might be even more satisfying. The Mocklins, the people of Bordas, Clyden, and Topa, have been known jerks since the first season. Their brutal, unapologetic misogyny should be unacceptable to the noble planetary union, but the Mocklins are the union's primary weapons manufacturers, which means they get to do whatever they want. Until episode 8, that is, when Mocklin agents kidnap Topa to torture her for information about her involvement in the Underground Railroad that smuggles Mocklin women off the planet to a sanctuary colony. Yeah, it sounds complicated when I just blurt it out like that, but it makes sense in context. Which you know, right? You've watched the show already. You're not spoiling it, are you? Anyway, once Topa is rescued and the Mocklin plot is revealed, it's the last straw. The Federation Council, Union, the Union Council votes to kick the Mocklins out and recognize the sovereignty of the Sanctuary Colony, placing the colony officially under Union protection. Even though expelling the Mocklins, who turn right around and form an alliance with longtime Union enemies, the Krill, leaves the Union in an extremely vulnerable position, the Council decides that this time, their principles demand that they do the right thing, not the strategically smart thing. Once again, very reminiscent of Star Trek, and also the West Wing, in that the episode shows us an outlandish fantasy of a government controlled by people who not only say they have morals, 
but also act as though they have them. And I thought it was far-fetched when there were just aliens walking around and shit. The Orville, not the West Wing, I mean. Or do I? The events leading up to the expulsion of the Mocklins from the Union tie in neatly with the story of Bordas and Topa, and also Clyden, who pulls an unexpected babyface turn and comes back to apologize for rejecting Topa following her transition. Bordas, Clyden, and Topa all renounce their Mocklin citizenship and remain on the Orville, their bond as a family renewed in a lovely counterpoint to the end of the toxic alliance with the Mocklins. Also, episode 8 is the one with the Dolly Parton cameo. And if you listen in the background during one of the scenes at the Mocklin Women's Sanctuary Colony, you can hear a medieval-sounding instrumental version of Jolene. The whole Mocklin women consider Dolly Parton a prophet thing is another thread that originates in the jokier first season of the show, and I'm glad they kept it. It's one of my favorite running gags in the series. Speaking of running gags, Malloy sends a sandwich a few months into the future using the time machine in episode 6, and in episode 10, it randomly arrives during a conversation between Malloy, Lamar, and Mercer. Now that's good storytelling. There are other multi-episode arcs this season that I haven't mentioned, most notably the one involving Mercer discovering he has a daughter with Talea, the Krill woman he dated in Season 2 while she was disguised as a human and working as a spy. In Season 3, Talea is elected leader of the Krill following a campaign that relied heavily on xenophobia, appeals to nationalism, and fake news. But thank God the Orville isn't all woke and political like Star Trek, huh? Speaking of which, again, in terms of both smaller character arcs and series-defining plot lines, the Orville Season 3 is better at season-long storytelling than any of the current generation of Star Trek shows, and is better, period, than any season of the current Trek shows, except Season 1 of Strange New Worlds. So, if you're looking for an answer to the question posed in the title of this video, that's how good Season 3 of The Orville is. Which is not to say it's without its flaws. This season consists of 10 episodes, fewer than previous seasons, which is a good thing, but the episodes are all much longer than in past seasons, which is not a good thing. The episodes in Season 3 are too long, especially Episode 8, which clocks in at nearly 90 minutes. There's nothing wrong with producing a 90-minute episode, if the story you're telling needs 90 minutes, but none of the episodes in Season 3 need more than the approximately 45-minute running time to which they would have been limited if the show were still being produced to air on Fox instead of going direct to streaming. The longer runtime feels like an indulgence. And as a result, even the best episodes, and as I've said, there are some outstanding episodes this season, drag or feel padded or run on for a few minutes after what should have been the ending. Also, Seth MacFarlane is not the best choice for a leading man. I'm not as down on him as an actor as some critics of the show are. He does have some nice moments. I like his righteously indignant reaction when he learns that Havina, leader of the Sanctuary Colony, has involved Topa in the underground network that smuggles Mocklin women off planet. But, well, let's just say it's obvious how he got the job. Also, the show indulges in one fresh bit of stunt casting, picking Babylon 5 veteran Bruce Boxleitner to play the president of the Planetary Union. Which is neat, I'll give him that, except Boxleitner is hidden under ridiculous alien makeup. You know it's him as soon as you hear that voice, but why cast a well-known actor from a classic sci-fi show if you're just going to wrap his head in blue rubber? And I know some fans will say, oh, but not every character can be human, we need to see some aliens. And to that, I offer this simple retort. The question all Orville fans have been asking since the end of Season 3 is, will there be a Season 4? As of this recording, we don't know. And truthfully, if Season 3 is the end, I'm okay with that. A show that began as an uneven, shamelessly derivative Star Trek knockoff was able to mature into a series that is smart, engaging, 
thought-provoking, compassionate, and yes, sometimes very funny. Don't get me wrong, if there are more seasons, and they're as good as season three, I welcome them. That would be great. But if not, the Orville had a good run. And it finished strong. As a fan, I'll take that. However, if you do yearn for additional seasons of the Orville, all hope is not lost. As of a few weeks ago, the Orville is hosted not only on Hulu, but on Disney+. Plus. Since Disney, unlike the new parent company of Warner Brothers and its streaming service HBO Max, still seems interested in actually producing entertainment rather than shelving or shit-canning content in order to take advantage of tax write-offs, it's possible that the third season of The Orville will not be the last. There may yet be new horizons for the show to explore. Personally, I'm crossing my fingers for a crossover with The Muppets. Talk about solid, long-form storytelling. They set that shit up back in season one. 